Cool. First and foremost, thanks for coming. As the title implies, we'll be doing some backend development and some reasoning about what backend development looks like in Rust today. In particular, we'll be talking about Pavex, which is a web framework I developed in the last 12 months, which tries to experiment with some directions, which are not necessarily very common in the Rust community as it stands now. Before, let's get acquainted. My name is Luca Palmieri. I am a software engineer and I currently Oh, Jesus. I currently work as a principal engineering consultant for Main Matter. Main Matter is a consulting company who, amongst other things, does Rust consulting. So we do training, team augmentation, code reviews, all the type of things that you may need if you are either considering adopting Rust or scaling your Rust usage. Before that, I was at AWS and at TrueLayer, which you've seen downstairs in the booths. You can find what I write online either on Twitter or on my website, which are both listed there. Said that, I have been in the Rust community for a few years, roughly five or six, I think, at this point. I built trainings, libraries, tools, so a little bit of everything. But I'm probably best known for being the author of Zero to Production in Rust. Zero to Production in Rust is a book which teaches you how to do backend development from scratch. So assuming you have basic familiarity with Rust constructs and taking you from there all the way to building functional applications. So today the agenda is quite simple. I'll give you some opinionated, takes on where Rust is when it comes to backend development. Then I'll, look you, I'll show you Pavex, a little bit of a demo, and I'll give you a little bit of a look of how stuff works out under the hood, as much as it fits within the time we have. So, is Rust a good choice for building backend systems? I have been asked these questions countless times, probably more than 100 at this point in time, and my answer is yes, with a caveat. So let's go into the yeses first. Jesus Christ. Um, Rust has good performance, which means it's... Can we switch to this mic by any chance at this point? Because it's like, I am annoying myself. So, so, so. Beautiful. Okay. It's fine, doesn't matter. Um, cool. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> We'll do a second take. So, is Rust a good language for backend development? Yes, there are some ifs and buts. So we'll go through the yeses first and the buts afterwards. First and foremost, Rust is a performant language. That's one of the reasons people actually turn to Rust very often. Rust doesn't have a garbage collection, which both allows you to have very fast systems and have, most importantly, in many applications, very predictable systems. Systems that you always take more or less the same time to do the same operations. When when you're trying to operate software in a production environment is actually a more important property to just speed. Secondly, Rust is also pretty good when you're building software in a team. It does feature one of the most expressive type systems that you can find in mainstream programming languages outside of the family of ML languages, so Haskell and friends. And that usually makes it so that when you are onboarding on a Rust code base, you may not be able to write code that compiles, so you, know, you may fail to deploy code to production, but you're prevented from pushing broken code to production, which is often a desirable property. Last but not least, Rust is a compiled language and is able to target all the mainstream platforms that backend development usually runs on. So you can target classics at x86-64 systems, you can target ARM, which is quite compelling since AWS Graviton, and you also can compile to WASM, which you know, unlocks for you a variety of serverless and serverless-like environments, which today are getting more and more popular. Rust also doesn't have a significant startup time beyond what your application does at startup, so the startup cost you incur yourself, which makes it pretty suitable to platforms that build by the milliseconds, such as AWS Lambda. So there's a lot of stuff to like. Nonetheless, and I state this as a fact, not really an opinion, Rust is not quite what I would define as a mainstream choice for backend development. If we take 100 devs, we need to write an API, it's unlikely that Rust would account for double digit percentage of those devs. People would turn to Java, Go, Python, JavaScript, other languages but Rust. But we have seen some limited success, like it's not a bleak story, like we have seen Rust gain footage and popularity in some niches in the world of backend. And I'm just gonna list the ones I've seen the most. So number one, as I mentioned, is high performance systems, where squeezing everything you can out of the hardware matters. These may be databases, this may be proxies, this may be trading system, 
or generally something where latency or throughput is key. Then you have high infrastructure footprint, which is a close cousin of high performance, but with a slightly different twist. Here you're not necessarily interested in going faster, you're interested in doing more with less hardware. So this might be the case of a backend system that you know, runs on a fleet of a thousand, tens of thousands, hundred thousand servers. This system exists, I've seen them, and when you're able to say the new system runs on 90% of that hardware, that can translate in millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of yearly infrastructure costs, plus uh, environmental gains if that's one of the metrics you care about. Last but not least, is high reliability requirements. So software where the price of an error is very high. This may be security related, so you're trying to do a bunch of checks, so you really wanna make sure that they are correct, or this may be just your business logic. Like I have personally built, architected, and deployed a Rust banking ledger. And there, you know, sending money to the wrong people is something you don't wanna do. And I see this so often that that's kind of a running quote in the Rust ecosystem. I don't know who attribute it to, I don't know who said it first, but people come to Rust for performance and they realize it's actually a great language for writing reliable software and they stay around for that, even if performance is not as important. So, we got it, all these cool things, you know, we got all these niches that we are getting foodled on. What's holding us back from being the next Ruby on Rails, fundamentally, because that's the target? I think there's three weaknesses, and this is my personal view, obviously, these are not truths. Uh, but let's start from the first one. We have a limited talent pool of people with professional Rust experience. Uh, this is a function, not really necessarily of the technology, but primarily of where Rust sits in the adoption curve. There's not been a lot of jobs in the backend ecosystem for Rust in the past few years, which means there's not a lot of professional who have actually built, deployed, and operated Rust production systems. And companies do care about this. I do consulting, as I mentioned at the beginning, I regularly talk to folks who are considering Rust or considering scaling Rust usage. This is one of the topics that recurringly comes into the conversation, either because they have somebody that knows Rust inside the company, but they're afraid that if they bet on Rust, that they're not gonna be able to hire other folks who can build a team around them. Or conversely, they've done some analysis by which Rust is a good choice. Like, you know, technologically, they think this fits into this puzzle hole, but I'm scared that I'm not gonna find the people that can actually build this system well, because I don't wanna hire somebody who's never done Rust professionally and then let them have the first try at my you know, mission critical piece of software. Nonetheless, this is kind of a problem that's gonna solve itself over time. You know, there's people getting hired for doing Rust, these people will change jobs, and this pool will grow bigger and bigger. So it's a temporary state of things, so not too bad. Secondly, and this is more painful, Rust has a Lego-like ecosystem. Now, we all like Legos, but here it's meant in a negative sense. So, uh, I set the clock of uh, Rust in the backend at a sync await stabilization, which is end on 2019, roughly when last first Rust Lab was held. That's where the popular version of the Rust ecosystem for backend as we know it today kind of got started. In those four years, uh, the Rust community has built a vast collection of extremely high-quality libraries. This is good. Nonetheless, this collection is perhaps too vast. And what I mean by this is that when you are starting with Rust, so when you are a beginner that needs to get started building web projects, web APIs, whatever you want to build, there's so much stuff you need to choose. Database drivers, async executors, cryptography libraries, you name it. And you don't necessarily have the knowledge to make the right choices because you're starting with Rust, right? It's a new language, you never used it. How am I supposed to know which of these things I need to use? And all these choices very often need to be made at the very beginning of your application because those are the foundational libraries you are gonna build your logic on. And this complexity compounds. So not only you need to choose the right or a good piece of software for every one of these tasks, these good pieces of software need to interoperate. And sometimes it's not as obvious that they will not. And when you find out, you either need to rewrite, you know, walk back, this can be painful and demotivating. What we need, really, and this is, uh, once again, something that comes up in conversations a lot with folks looking at Rust or getting started with Rust, is a curated set of crates, like curated set of functionality that covers the spectrum of what people need to do and has a somewhat coordinated version in policy, which matters a lot in you know, corporate environments and more company-heavy use cases. 
In other words, this is a backend focused distribution in the spirit of a Linux distribution, so a curated collection software. This is not the standard library, let me make that very clear. Like, the standard library has a versioning policy, which is we don't version. And that is not good enough for a domain like backend, which changes, requirements change, the way of doing things change, so you can't say, I have the solution, and that's the one we're gonna use for the next 70 years. Otherwise, you end up like Python. Said that, some of you may say that this is impossible because the Rust ecosystem is a highly diverse ecosystem. There's different crate orders, different maintainers, different needs, which is true. Nonetheless, that's exactly what every company that adopts Rust needs to do. They're doing it today. Every single one is building their own company-specific backend distribution for Rust. I've done it multiple times. I know people have done it. And the truth is, you know, there's a lot of these choices that you need to make. Sometimes you pick the right stuff, other times you don't. Um, I've been doing interviews for the past six months to folks who have been using Rust for a few years, so long enough, you know, to regret some of their choices. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, like, if you look at the data they had available at the time when they said, I'm gonna use this, or I'm gonna use that, they made reasonable good guesses. Uh, but, you know, sometimes stuff doesn't pan out. And this leads us to the third weakness, which I think, and this is specific to Rust in the backend, it's not Rust, you know, in the absolute sense. We could have some opinions on that, but we're not gonna talk about that. Is there's a suboptimal learning curve. And I think in the backend specifically, this boils down to a tension, which is a design tension. So on one side, you know, we are coming to Rust for safety, performance, all these things but also because of the great economics. Like, we have a great tool chain, which I think is an understated reason for Rust's success at large uh, in the world of programming. And so we want that nicety, like that good tooling that teaches you how to do things, we want to bring that into our crates. Like, we want every crate to be as good as Toot. Nonetheless, on the other side, and this is a feeling I share, you want to write tools that make it so that whatever gets built on those tools is correct. Like, you want to write tools that significantly, materially, raise the bar of correctness for what comes on the other side. And usually you want to do this at compile time, because if you do it at compile time, there's no way the wrong outcomes can go out because the program doesn't run. You yeah, know, makes sense. Combine that with the fun that you're doing backend, and so you want to build things on top of a syncrust. And this is kind of an explosive mix. You know, when you put all these things into the pot, you get something that's a bit tricky. So. Once back, you know, go back to the beginner. I'm starting Rust, and so I use all these tools that are designed to do all these checks and are very nice. I actually get thrown in the face a lot of Rust advanced constructs from the get-go. Like, as soon as I start to do an hello world that writes two things into a database, I'm already at, you know, all the Rust book plus a bunch, which is intimidating. Um, I think you've all been here. Uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't put any specific screenshot because I don't think it's a specific library problem, but we've all been there, stating at a compiler, compiler error in the terminal that mentions a bunch of traits which you actually haven't used, but somehow are used in the library you're using. And they're not satisfied, and they're saying some stuff around seven tuples, and there's like sense sync, and in the worst case, it's also a bunch of static. And, you know, you studied Rust two days ago, you've read a few chapters of the book, uh, you don't debug this. Like, you pattern match, you Google it, Yes, copilot, but really, like, you are not understanding what you're doing, which is bad. This is a recipe for churn. Like, this is a recipe for people who said, I read about Rust that I can use, I tried it out, not for me, I'll come back in two years. We don't want that, because, you know, the hype brings the people, but then if you fail to retain them, they might not come back. So, some of these issues can be mitigated. You know, if you have a guide, like an experienced mentor that takes you on the journey, that carves you a path, that carefully you know, raises the difficulty level in such a way that it's always difficult enough to be challenging, but easy enough to be solvable, then you have a good experience. And you come out at the end that you have the muscle to go and solve those issues yourself, and you also appreciate the type of tooling that you, you know, is made available to you. Nonetheless, not everybody has this mentor. You know, some people find it in a colleague, which may be there. Some people find it in open source maintainers. Other people find it in books, courses, videos, but it's not a given, like it's a luxury. Companies can hire these mentors, but also that's a price. And that's fundamentally why I think we are quite not cracked, uh, the mainstream language backend development toolkit we trust at this point in time. Nonetheless, you know, this is a Rust conference. I've been a Rust developer for five years. 
I want it to be a mainstream language, and I think it could be. Which brings us to Pavex. Don't get the wrong impression that C solves all these problems, it doesn't, but you know, it tries to make some steps in that direction. So, Pavex is a new framework for building Rust APIs. Uh, it was born as an experiment at the end of 22, when I got frustrated about some of the compiler errors that I alluded at before. I was like, I've been doing Rust for six years, I can't debug this. How can you know, a reasonable person be expected to do it? So, the question is, can we offer a better developer experience if we choose a radically different approach without giving up those compile time checks that we truly like? Now, I want to demo this, but I need two ends, so I need a volunteer <laughs> to hold this mic because this is not going to hold this stuff here. <laughs> Beautiful, sorry very much for doing this. <laughs> and we also got another microphone, yay! Amazing. Uh, you can use this if you want to. Cool, uh, 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 it's, okay. It's, okay. it's good. Can you hear me? Nice. This is the third mic in one talk, this must be a new record. Um, so, first and foremost, can you read this all the way to the back? Not say yes, yeah, cool. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> uh, what is Pavex? Uh, well, this probably you cannot read, uh, so let me make this a lot bigger. So your first encounter with Pavex is usually going to be a CLI in a terminal. So it's a command that you can install, it's a binary, there's a bunch of stuff. In particular, it has a command called Pavex new, and this is very similar to, you know, cargo new. Scaffolds a project for you from scratch. So let's say I want to do this Pavex new conference, and this is going to create a bunch of files into a conference folder that do things that we're now we're going to explore. Now, the Rust compiler is a lot of things, but fast, especially on a fresh project, is not one of them. So for this demo, I'm going to do like cooking shows. I have another one already ready with cache dependencies. So we're going to start from there. This is going to be our demo project. You get a readme. And the readme tells you that you need three things to run a Pavix project. You need Rust, I mean, kind of obvious. You need Cargo PX, which we're going to go into in a second, the Cargo sub command, and you need the Pavix CLI. We got all these things installed, so we can keep going. The commands to build, run, and test look very similar to the ones you're used to, with a minor difference that this goes through a sub command, and we'll see why in a second. The template comes out with some configuration setups, which allows you to run the application with different profiles, usually. The typical is like test, development on a local machine and production. So this is the command that we're gonna be running throughout the demo. So we're just launching the API in development um, setup and doing stuff with it. Now, the API run, commits uh, log messages in Boonian, which is like a JSON specification. So I'm gonna pipe it into the Boonian command just to give you something that looks nice in the uh, terminal. And so you see, starting to listen for incoming requests, it a certain port 8000. Now, where is, how do we read this? Now, the key file you need to look at is this blueprint module. The blueprint module is where you define what the application should look like. This is where you put routes, middlewares, error handlers, and a bunch of other stuff that we're gonna look into. First and foremost, you can see this as a single route, so it's a get method on API ping, which goes down to a certain ping handler. So, you know, trust no one. Um, so let's try and check if this actually works. So we're gonna do localhost 8000 slash API slash pink. Cool, curl it under 200, and you can see that this has a bunch of setup out of the box for making sure that you know what the hell is happening on your server. So registers, status codes, methods, bunch of information. Cool, let's go back. So let's assume that, as always, you know, you're starting to use a new framework because it looks cool and you don't read the documentation. So you go and you try to do things that kind of pattern match on the code that's available. So let's say that we want to do, oh, Copilot, you're annoying. I don't want you now. Uh, disable completion. Yes. Let's do it like 2021. Uh, so we do slash API, and we want to do hello world, right, which we're going to call slash greet. And then we need to put here some kind of request handler. So let's add a new module inside the routes folder. Oop, mode. Pub mode greet, and we are gonna generate a greet module. Now, if we go back here, what does ping look like? Ping look like, you know, pretty reasonable thing, status code, okay, uh, this is what I wanna do. So let's do greet. You know, we wanna return hello world, so we're gonna be obtuse and do the obvious thing, return hello world. 
And then we're gonna tell the blueprint that that's the function that, ooh, that was bad, that we want to invoke, read, read. Lovely, uh, so then we go back here and we try to compile. And this is your first encounter with 5 error messages. This is not actually coming from the Rust compiler, this is coming from us. And this is telling, uh, telling us that something we did is not right. Uh, it's pointing in particular at the new handler that we have just registered, and it says, this handler, I can actually use it as a request handler because I cannot use the type it returns to create an, uh, an HTTP response. In particular, because it doesn't implement this into response trait. Now, we haven't read the docs, so this is the point in time where you go open it and you search for into response, which is a trait. Oh, small. Um, and then you say, okay, what does implement into response? There's fundamentally three things. Status code, which is what we saw before. Response head, which is a response without a body. And then you have a response with a body. And this is because Favex wants to make your life easy, but doesn't want to make assumptions that might not be true and you know, might be painful to find out when that is the case. Such as, should a piece of code that can be turned into a body return a 200, a 201? What kind of status code should I use? So let's force you to actually tell me that. Um, so we're gonna return a response. Response has a bunch of easy constructors. That's one for each status code, so we can do response.ok. And then this has a bunch of setter methods that we can invoke. Uh, we want to set the body because that's where hello world should go reasonably if you're a normal person. Um, you can put it in two ways. You can do set row body. This is going to set the body and nothing else. So, you know, serialize to bytes, ship it over the network. Or we can do set type body. What this does is it infers the content type based on the type that you're passing, uh, which, ooh, well, wrong copy which might be a reasonable thing to do, uh, and then you need to box it so that it matches the response signature. Now, with this new and advanced uh, use case, we can actually try to get Hello World running. So this is gonna compile, this looks okay. Now I'm gonna rely on my, yes, on my terminal history. Uh, use Outwin, good credit, you should check if you wanna do this kind of stuff. And you can see it returns hello world, which is correct. And it also set the content type to text plain and all the other stuff that you expect in a response. So, so far, pretty good. Not impressive, it's hello world, but you know, a lot of stuff has to go right for hello world to show up. So you'll be impressed later. Said that, um, let's try to do an hello world which is a tiny bit more advanced. Um, so we wanna do an hello world that greets us by name because it's a very polite thing to do. So we're gonna add a parameter. Now, uh, Pavex uses the same, not Lucas, a bit uh, narcissistic um, name. <laughs> we are gonna do, uh, use the same syntax that you're probably used to from Maxum, and that is because underneath we use the same routing library, which is Matchit, uh, which is great, and we love it very much. Thanks, Ibrahim. Said that, how do I actually go from having the name in the path to having the name in my route? Uh, if you have been doing some Rust, you probably expect to be some magic extractor, and that's exactly what, you know, what we're gonna do. Um, so you go, once again, back to the docs, and you say, I wanna do a route parameter. What do I have? Well, here's a route parameter for you. This is very small again. And this is what it looks like in an example. So you simply say, I want my params, I get the route params, and then you specify how to parse data out of those params. And so we're gonna do exactly the same. So we're gonna call our struct, so we're gonna annotate it with the route params macro, and we're gonna call this pubstruct read params. At the moment, we have only name in the uh, route, so we're gonna say this is a string. And then we are gonna say in greet, please give me params. Our params slash read params. Very cool, and then we are just gonna destructure that. So this goes name oop, equal params dot zero. And then we can replace this with a format that says hello. Ooh, hello name, and then an exclamation mark because we're excited. So let's recompile, and this thing should compile, yes. And then we can check that, first of all, the route now returns a 404 because it expects an extra route parameter, and then when we pass the route parameter, it actually greets us by name. So, so far, so good. Now, one thing that happens on applications and in software in general is that what you write today is not gonna survive tomorrow, but tomorrow may be very far in the future, and the people who do tomorrow may not be yourself. So, you know, you go here and you say, I wanna do some changes, now we wanna be formal, so we wanna do first name, last name. Right, this is fine, like we can just rename this, it's gonna be okay. 
or actually you do one step refactoring. You simply say, let's name this first name as the starting point. And you don't know about the software because you didn't write it yourself, so you think it's gonna be okay. Now, in a normal application, if you do that, this is gonna panic around time because now you're trying to extract a raw parameter which is not named as the one in the route. And you're gonna find out only if you have tests. Everybody writes tests, right? But not always. And so some of this stuff kind of slips through the cracks. And here goes the second error message we're gonna see today. Pavex doesn't stop just at validating, you know, the usual things, does this implement trade ABC? Uh, it also looks into some of the concepts which are inherent into the domain of backend development. Like, what are raw parameters? I understand what raw parameters are. So this is telling us with very verbose, fully qualified path, I know it's painful, I'm gonna make that better, that this route is trying to extract some grid parameters, but every struct field from what we're trying to extract is supposed to be named after one of the parameters that appear in the route. In our case, we use name, but there's no struct field name name. So this is not what I've Either we remove the fields that are invalid or we rename them to match. And so that's exactly what we're gonna do. So we go back to greet and we basically say, this needs to be first name. And then this fails and then Rust Rover is not smart enough. So it doesn't actually see that this is gonna fail, but I know it and I'm gonna fix it. So that we recompile. Once again, recompile is fairly fast. And then we can be greeted again pretty much by the same message. Okay, how did this magic happen? How did route params actually know what to do? Now, there's a bit of magic to wrap arms with some extra validation, which is a built-in in the framework, but the reality of things is that you can actually do this yourself. But it's nothing special. This is user land framework code, where you're basically saying, I want you to be able to construct a route params, use this method, and a bunch of stuff around lifecycle. But to truly understand things, you want to do them yourself. So let's try to construct a type that we can inject. I'm going to make a simple example, which is we want to look at the user agent. So user agent, new module, right here. Let's say that we care ooh, about two cases. We care about, uh, no, uh, no, that's why I wanted to pilot, uh, no, mean, unknown. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there's a case where we don't know who the user is, and there's a case where we know who the user is. So we're gonna extract the other value out of the user agent header. And we might wanna do this for some reasons. In this case, we're gonna suppose it's a good way to do authorization, it really isn't. Uh, but you know, there's only so much time I can spend on this podium. So we wanna be able to go and have the user agent in here. So we are gonna be naive once again and try to say, hello framework, give me a user agent. Now, the reasonable among you will expect this to fail because you just defined a new type and then you're telling somebody, give me one. And they should say, oh, what have I done? Yes, correct. It's just that it's so zoomed in and don't recognize it. Um, so you've tried to inject a user agent, which is a type, but I don't know how to construct this type. Like I have no knowledge of how this is supposed to be built, so I cannot give you one. If you want this to happen, we need, you need to give me a recipe. Like you need to give me a constructor. And the thing is, is this error actually speaks to you in the language of the framework, once again. It's not telling you that sometime doesn't implement some other trait which has a bunch of stuff. It's actually telling you in plain language, plain English, what you need to do. And you know, we are obedient, as the Rust compiler taught us, and so we're gonna follow instructions. Um, so we're gonna go bp.constructor. What do we need to pass? So we need to pass what to invoke for the constructor. Now I'm gonna make a mistake on purpose, uh, which is to just pass the type, which obviously, I mean, it's a recipe in a way, you can have the default constructor, but it's not quite right. The other thing you need to pass is a life cycle. Now, when you are injecting types, as Pavix does, it means that you are delegating to the framework the invocation of these constructors. Like, the, the framework needs to know when to build stuff. In particular, it needs to know when to build it and for how long to hold on to the value that's being built. And we currently support three types of life cycle. So the first one is singleton. This is a type that needs to be built once for the entire life cycle of your application. From that point onward, everyone who needs a value of that type needs to get the same type. This might be a static reference to something or it might be an arc, for example, that gets cloned. This is usually used for stuff like connection pools. You create a connection pool at the beginning of the application. Everyone that wants a connection grabs the same pool and asks the pool nicely for a connection. Secondly is request scoped. It's something that needs to be built every time a new request comes in because this type of value is request specific. 
User agent, the one we're trying to do now, falls squarely into this case because every request will have a different user agent and letting value leak from you know, one request to the other is, can lead to very painful bugs. If you've used a splat core, you've been there, I feel for you. Last but not least, that's transient, which basically means every single time somebody asks for this, build a new one. Um, this is a few niche use cases, but we're not gonna go into those. So as we said, user agent, it's very nice you know, request scope type. If we try to compile, this once again is not gonna work because we just told it, you know, this is the type, but it needs to know either a function or a method. Like I'm not using enum as a constructor. It's like too ambiguous. So let's give it a method. Uh, let's say imp user agent, pub function extract, because we're not uh, very inventive when it comes to naming. How do we extract? Well, we need the request. So the request is one of the things that you can you know, inject inside your constructors. Constructors are like request handlers. They also can do dependence injection. So this thing is recursive. And you want to return self. So request add is the request minus the body. So we can simply say dot adders. Then here we can try to get. Uh, user agent is a well-known adder. Um, so you can import it from the HTTP module. May or may not be there. If it's there, we are going to say uh, uh, whoa, 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 user agent known uh, as dot clone. It's getting long. Please format it. Yes. Um, and if it's not there, we are going to default to user agent unknown. And then we can go inside the blueprint and actually say, yo, use this method. This also is getting long. Thank you. Now, at last, this works. Compiles. Now, it's not very interesting because apart from actually injecting the user agent, we're not doing anything with it. But we could, you know, we want to convince ourselves that this is actually working. And so we could say, if the user agent is unknown, uh, I want you to return a 403. Uh, forbidden. Don't do this, really. But this is just to show you that you can. Um, and then if we try to curl it, which we had right here. Now, this is going to succeed because, um, well, ooh, the terminal just piece more. But curl, by default, injects uh, its own user agent, which you should actually see in the logs. Curl slash 812. So you can tell curl very politely uh, to not do that. So let's move my surname. And then when it doesn't do that, it works as expected. So we can see that what we wrote is actually invoked. The logic that you know, we want it to be executing is actually being executed. So good, like it's doing what it's told. Now, let's assume that this was actual you know, authentication authorization. Usually you don't want to embed this into every single request handler because you might forget about one or the implementation might diverge. You want to centralize this in one checkpoint that runs for all the routes. And so we're going to do just that. We're going to write a middleware. Now, we already have a middleware uh, inside this code base is the one that's pushing logs back and forth. So once again, no docs, we just copy. So let's look at the logger. This is the logger middleware. What does the logger do? The logger receives next. Next is a reference to the rest of the processing chain. So it's any middleware that comes after this, plus at the end, the request handler. Now, middlewares, just like constructors, just like request handlers, can do dependence injection. So this is also asking for some root span data that means something to the logger. We don't quite care. The fundamental contract, this needs to return a response or a result, although we're not gonna go into that. So this is gonna say, okay, I have next. In this case, we wanna convert it into a future and then we wanna instrument it. So we wanna run some instrumentation around the execution time of that future. And then we return the response at the end. So we are gonna be very diligent and copy paste. So we go down into the user agent module. We are gonna rename this to reject unknown. I'm not gonna spell anonymous again. Um, so we wanna get next. Now, in our case, root spawn, no, we don't care. We want the user agent. Like that's the thing we're using for rejecting things. Cool, import the response, and then into futures comes from the standard library, but it's not in the prelude, so you gotta import it. So what do we do? We do exactly what we were doing inside the route. So we go down here, we delete this code, we just move it here. So if the user agent is unknown, response forbidden. Otherwise, we delegate to the rest of the processing chain. So if this precondition is met, keep going, like do what you need to do. Uh, now let me do some cleanup because I hate seeing warnings in the terminal about the new stuff. And we can just register this middleware at the top. The function that you use is called wrap because you are wrapping the computation that comes after you. 
And middlewares are ordered. Like, ordered is very significant because middlewares have side effects. So we're putting this squarely below the telemetry middleware because requests that are rejected should still be logged. So we want the logging middleware to run first, and then we want to do whatever, you know, access control we want to do. And so we go create user agent, boom, reject unknown. Uh, yeah, I have the right number of parentheses. And so now we want to verify, ooh, no, not that, that these compiles and runs, blah, blah, blah. And so we can still access the stuff that uses a user agent, and we're still rejected when the user agent is not there. So we have successfully converted that into a middleware. And that's pretty much everything I wanted to show you in this demo because I cannot speak until 2 p.m., although we very much like to. So let's go back to the presentation. What have you just seen? Um, I wanted to showcase not an extensive feature set, but a little bit of the bits and pieces that give you a sense of what the design direction is and where we want to go with this. So core tenet number one, we want high quality error messages. We want something that is as good as what the Rust compiler has you know, spoiled you with in the past five to six years. And in particular, we want these error messages to speak at the right level of abstraction. You're building a backend API, your error messages should talk about backend. Because that's the thing you understand, that's the thing you're trying to do. And so this is what we saw before. So we understand raw parameters, we understand uh, routing in general, and a bunch of other stuff. You know, I could do a demo just getting stuff wrong and showcasing all the hard errors I implemented. Secondly, we want stuff that works. So we want to catch all these errors at compile time without giving up the good error messages we just saw. This makes it so that the feedback loop is faster. A lot of tests you don't need to write because they get lifted pretty much inside the framework and should lead to happy life. Especially if you're called, you know, um, brought a pager with you for a few years, as I have. And here you can see, for example, that if there is routing ambiguity, when you've registered a bunch of routes that are quite, you know, overlap in some cases, you're not gonna find out a at runtime where some of the code you expect to be invoked doesn't get invoked. All this validation is done straight away before the application actually runs. Last but not least, and this goes back to the weaknesses we were talking about before, you should be able to get a lot of mileage out of boarding rust. Like you should be able with basic knowledge of traits, lifetimes, structs and enums to write an application that does something that is not entirely trivial. And so you've seen before that the um, middleware, you know, anonymous, spelled correctly, uh, the middleware that we wrote is actually fairly simple. Like we have one generic, that generic Verb bound is not something you need to think about. If you forget it, the compiler will tell you, add this, because that's the only one this type makes sense for. And that you just write code that's very procedural, and that's how it should be. Last but not least, but this you actually haven't seen in the demo, is that our aspiration is to be batteries included. So we don't want to tackle, you know, is lies of the problem. We don't want to tackle parsing HTTP protocol, or routing request, or managing state. We want to tackle all those things and the other things that you need to build APIs, authentication, authorization, configuration, client generation, how to write good tests. Everything you need to actually ship high quality applications because that's what people do when they pick a language to build an application. The end goal is the application. But you don't get there overnight, you don't build roaming one day, uh, so we're starting from the foundation. So the mechanism that will underpin the way this framework tries to fulfill uh, this mission. Said that, uh, the past 15 minutes were the wow, you know, factor. It's like, oh, cool. Uh, now it's the horrifying factor. How does this actually work under the hood? I promise it's not going to be as horrifying as the previous talk, but it might get very close. So, and also, depending on the programmer you are, this might solicit different reactions. This was Eliza uh, when she saw the crate for the first time. It's a simple, lightweight, easy to use web framework powered by the blood of forsaken children. Uh, I got this framed, uh, it's beautiful. <laughs> Let's see why she had this very strong uh, gut feeling. Uh, so as you saw in the demo, you start out by filling a declarative blueprint, which basically is, tell me what the application needs to do, what the routes are, uh, tell me what the middlewares are, tell me how to build the types that you use. Now, well, I spoiled it, it's fine. Uh, what, is what is weird about this code, if you look at it, if you like parse it, the thing that might jump to you as a bit odd or perhaps you know, unexplained is what that F macro is actually doing. Now, it's actually a pretty simple macro. Uh, this is the full definition. I've omitted an expect message which is this long just for brevity, uh, but it doesn't add much to the functionality. Um, this is just 
taking the expression that you pass as input and stringifying it and assigning that to the input path field. And then we're also capturing the package that invoked this macro for reasons related to diagnostics that we're gonna go into later. So if you look at the API ping registration, which is the one I studied from in the template, this is just the sugars to this. So that's not, nothing too bad is happening so far. We just wanna know the import path as a string, and we wanna know that this happened inside the RustLab crate. This matters for crate resolution. Now, we want high quality error messages that speak the language of the backend. I'm just gonna say this and get, until I get tired of saying it, which means we don't rely on trade bounds for compile time static analysis. If you go in the route definition, so the method that the blueprint actually exposes from the framework, this once again is the full definition. There's no secrets, I'm not omitting stuff. It's self because we're you know, concatenating an additional route to a vector. The method guard, get post, whatever you wanna use, the path slash API ping, and then the row callable. So the output of that macro you just saw. All validation and analysis which are domain specific are deferred to the Pravex transpiler. So you saw before Pavex new, which scaffolds the project. Pavex generate does the actual code generation. So it takes the blueprint as input and it processes it to generate the code that actually runs at runtime. So the blueprint is a file. It looks like this. It's more because you don't actually need to read it. You just need to be wowed by how long it is. Uh, and the idea is that you, know, you have a vector of constructors, a vector of middlewares, a vector of routes, a vector of error handlers. For each of those, that's exactly the data you pass to the blueprint plus a bunch of spans which will be used in diagnostics. So to know where to put those like little highlights in the errors, otherwise we don't know where those are. Now the transpiler is where all the compile time validation takes place, but you know, if there are no errors, in the end the outcome is to do something, not just to show nice errors, it transpiles. So it generates a new crate, which is called a server SDK. It's called SDK because it's a library, not a binary. So it's a toolkit to build a server. The server SDK is where everything gets combined together. So it's where the dependency injection actually takes place. So it takes all the routes, all the constructors, all the middlewares, and wires them one after the other. Let's have a look at the code, just you know, to show that there are no, well, there are some skeletons, but there's more. Um, so, so far, everything we've done in the demo was in the Rust lab crate. Like we haven't touched any other file that you can see. Let's go into the server SDK crate. Uh, this is generated. The generation is done by this uh, annotation in the cargo toml. You're telling PX, so cargo PX, so that binary that I used throughout the demo, that this crate needs to be generated. This is not about code generation, this is about crate generation. This dependency, code generated, like you haven't actually spelled them out. It, they are inferred from what your blueprint contains. And so you're telling cargo PX, this crate needs to be generated. You generate it by running a workspace binary, so something that's defined in this workspace that's called BP. BP is defined in RustLab and is actually quite simple. Client is just a way to invoke the public CLI without having to write std process command yourself and says new, generate is the command, Blueprint here, put it inside this directory. So that's the extent of the generator you gotta write. It's actually just a bunch of boilerplate. Once you invoke Cargo PX, Cargo PX looks you know, at the shape of your workspace. Actually, we can look at that right here in the logs. So computes the package graph, determines that it needs to compile BP because it's the code generator for the SDK, then invokes the code generator, so generates the SDK, and then actually does the compilation of all the other crates. Cool, what does the SDK look like? Well, at the moment it's just, you know, a gigantic single lib rest where all the stuff takes place. I've been postponing breaking this down into files, it will happen. But at the top level, you care about three things. Uh, application state, that's a struct that contains all the things that need to be alive for the lifetime of your application. So all your singletons, the stuff we talked about before. In this case, it's empty because our application didn't have any singletons, but if they were there, they would be here. And the companion is called build application state. So it generates a constructor for that struct that you need to invoke yourself because that needs to happen before the application is launched. And the third item that you care about is run. Run takes the application state and the server configuration. Ports, HTTPS, all the usual stuff that you care about. Puts them together, runs the application. Below, you find all the actual code. Uh, so the router, all these kind of invocations. Uh, let's look at one of these, for example. So we register three middlewares, logger, reject anonymous, and the actual handler. This is the code that does the thing. So we need to invoke the first middleware, which is the logger. 
the logger requires a root span. So the root span is built here. The root span requires in turn the request head and wants to know what route has been matched. So those are injected as inputs. And then we need to pass some state down the middleware chain because other middlewares or the android might refer to that state. Then you get to middleware one, which is reject unknown. Same thing, this one is a user agent. So here is the user agent extraction and that gets passed. Last but not least, you go all the way down in the handler, which in this case is ping. And then there's a bunch of stuff to make sure we don't box. Don't look at that, it's painful. It's gonna go away at the end of December when we get asynchronous traits. Cool, that's all you need to know. In reality, you don't care. Like, you don't actually go look into this file unless you have a problem. But when there is a problem, you're glad the file is there. The difference with respect to macros is that this code generation is visible to you. So if you want to understand what is being done, it's just very boring, but it's just all written down there. So if you suspect that there is a bug, you can actually go and inspect the code. It also means that the code is generated once, and at that point, it's just a normal crate. You can just publish it somewhere. It's just a very long procedural file. So as I said, top level, two item, run an application state. These are the two that you actually use uh, for the server binary. So the server binary is this third crate. This is the actual executable. This is the thing that serves requests. What does it do? Well, a bunch of setup, making sure we have telemetry, making sure we're logging panics, and then it just builds the application state, loads configuration, configures the server, which is basically saying, listen on a certain port, which is determined from the configuration, and then calls run. That's it, like this crate just exists to basically do the init. So if you look at it as a set of boxes and arrows, this is what it looks like. Blueprint, declared definition, used to generate the SDK, imported by the, binary, by the server. The SDK can be used to do multiple things. So you could use it, for example, to do integration tests, because now you have bounds to all the routes, and those bounds are real. Like it's not like this code that runs before the routes. All the code, all the middleware is inside. So that's quite nice. If you want to look at it in another way, there's two colors. The green stuff, you write yourself. The yellow stuff gets in ready for you. So why do we need three crates? Why don't we just use a macro? Uh, the reality is that Pavex works because it has a compile time reflection engine. We need to know what inputs does a function take, what output does it return. Do we have a constructor for this type? And similar things, and a bunch of stuff around traits. To answer those questions, we need information, and we want it at compile time. And as you might know, Rust does not have, unfortunately, a compile time reflection engine, nor a plan for a compile time reflection engine that there's consensus on. Uh, you have macros. That's as far as you go with metaprogramming. But macros operate on tokens. They have no type level information. Example I use very often to drive this concept home is the SQL underscore query macro here. If you do SQL underscore query bang and then select star from users, the macro sees select star from users. And you, know, you can do static analysis on the SQL, make sure it works, all the nice things. But if you do a small refactoring, because you wanna put that into a constant and then you wanna pass the constant into the macro, this doesn't work anymore. The macro sees query. Query is a token. The macro has no way to go to the compiler and say, could you please tell me what query stands for? No, it's just not available. So, macro won't cut it, what do we do? Uh, well, we are powered by a different thing, which is called RustDocJSON. Where does your mind go when I say RustDocJSON? Well, RustDoc, actually, really. Well, mind goes here, goes on docs.rs. That's the website you go to every single day when you're doing Rust code and you're like, what signatures does this actually use? Now, boxes and arrows again, what does RustDoc do? Rust create as input, HTML as output. Well, why not JSON? And that's fundamentally what RustDocJSON is. It's the same information on docs.rs, you know, all the signatures with inputs and outputs, all the straight implementations, all the juicy stuff that we want, but instead of doing web scraping, we get a schema and JSON format, which is nice. It is in Nightly, it was introduced in an RFC in June 2020, is the work of the RustDoc team, which I cannot thank enough for actually shipping this, and they're working to get it to stable, which is a lift, uh, but it's gonna enable a lot of use cases, so thank you very much. Particularly, uh, shout out to Gene, Alon, uh, and Guillaume, who often deal with me, and a few others who ask questions about it. Now, you can try this yourself. Uh, you just do cargo, tell it that you need to use Nightly, RustDoc, the target, in this case, library, and then you say outperformance JSON, and yes, I know what I'm doing, give me a stable options. You can look at an example just to get a feel of what this looks like. Let's take a struct from a create I, I write, which is called target arcs. Public struct for fields. 
benches, tests, examples, or targets, all public, all booleans. If you go into the JSON, this is what it looks like. So every item gets an ID, it's unique, doesn't quite matter. Uh, create ID tells you where the item belongs. In this case, create ID is zero, zero is a special number, means it belongs to the create you were generating docs for. So I was generating docs for Cargo Chef, this is defined in Cargo Chef. Then we get the name of the struct, the visibility, public, and then here there's an enum. So this is JSON, the enum gets the sugar to a tag, and then the stuff inside the enum. Enum is a struct, so that tells us, you know, we have some stuff about fields, this might be generic and have generics, and then we get links to all the implementations, either implementation blocks, which are inherent to the struct, or trade implementations. And you can follow the IDs, like the spiders. Um, so you can go and get benches. Uh, benches was one of the fields. And so the kind this time is struct field. And then the inner tells us it's a bool, because it's a primitive type. And in reality, you don't actually look at the JSON most of the time. Uh, you just use a crate called Rustock types. This is maintained by the uh, upstream Rustock folks, gets released in lockstep uh, with new nightlies. So when they make changes to the schema, you just do cargo update, fix a few very minor things, and just get the information. And it becomes something that looks like this. Which is very scene-like, uh, for those of you who write macros, just dumber, as in like, this is a purely representational crate. So just, this, you know, uh, deserializes the things, doesn't give you methods to do stuff on the things. RESDOC.JSON format is in nightly, as I said before, uh, but since we only use it for reflection, we don't actually use it at runtime, Pavex uses nightly to generate the code, but then the code that gets generated runs unstable. So in reality, if you have the constraint of not using nightly in production, this is fine. But there's a variety of tooling that is doing this. Uh, let me mention some of my favorites. Uh, number one, cargo sample checks. This is the thing that tells you if APR is breaking your API. How does this actually work? Uh, you know, in a way that's gonna butcher the complexity underneath. Takes main, generate JSON docs for main, takes the APR, generates JSON docs for your create on the APR, diffs the two JSONs in a smart, very interesting way, and tells you it's good, it's not good. It's not good because A, B, C, D. Similar vein, cargo check external types. This is maintained by the AWS SDK team. The AWS SDK, uh, I think it's something along the lines of a few hundred crates for all the AWS stuff. And they need to know what public types they expose from third party crates because they wanna be in control of breaking changes. They don't wanna bump a dependency and suddenly break downstream users. When you have one crate and two files, easy, you do it by hand. When you have, uh, I think some of the stress benchmark for the compiler, such as AWS SDK EC2, is very tricky to do it by hand. Tooling, generate the JSON docs, walk the JSON, find all the types, determine where they come from. And then they have an allow list that says, you can go, no, you are a mistake. Last but not least, Pavex. So everything I've showed you so far works with the same system. If we go back to the blueprint, which we showed at the beginning, now we can understand why the F macro does what it does. For each of those things, what do we do? We determine what credit was defined into. This takes the beginning of the segment, plus you know, crates can be renamed, so there's a bunch of trickery there to make sure this works with all the features that Cargo support, but it does. Then you generate JSON docs for that crate, and then you look up whatever item you were curious about, uh, and perhaps his inputs, his options, and stuff. You combine everything together, and you build a call graph. Call graph which spiritually looks somewhat like this. There's a request handler at the bottom that you want to invoke. This has a bunch of inputs. For each of those inputs, you say, is it a singleton? Then it's just there. Do I need to build it? Yes, let's add a node with the thing that builds it. Does that have inputs that need to be built? Let's build those. And you build this for every request handler, for every middleware, and then you look at this graph to do things. So you look at this graph for static analysis, so errors, and to drive code generation, so to generate all the code we looked at. I get signals from the back, so I stop. Um, so, oh, just in time. Wrapping up. Um, Time was limited, I just wanted to scratch the surface to show you a little bit of the vibe, really, for what we're building here. The approach we're taking, which is stage compilation, uh, introduces some complexity on the tooling side, but also opens up a world of possibilities. All the instrumentation, we know a lot about types, so we can generate specs. We could do graph analysis to exploit concurrency opportunities in some of the things you gotta compute. We can generate code for different targets. Servers, Lambda functions, serverless environments, in the end, it's not that different. You just need a little bit of changes in the bindings. 
I convinced you, you want to use it, where do you go? Uh, it's not yet generally available. You won't find this on Crates.io, but I'm running a closed beta. It's a way to get a bunch of folks that have some time on their end and want to try things out to work very closely with me so that when it goes out, it's polished and we don't break the API one time every month for a year. If you want to join this, it's on pavex.dev. Just a few questions to understand who you are. Pavex is open source. You'll find it on GitHub. It's Apache 2 licensed. It'll stay Apache 2 licensed but this is a commercial project. This takes a lot of time, and I want to be able to sustain this. So there will be some kind of monetization at a certain point. So as we say in Italian, you know, long friendship are based on very clear terms. So these are the terms. Said that, I have exhausted my time, is very nervous. If there's time for questions, I'll ask questions. Otherwise, grab me in the hallway, grab me at lunch. I'm happy. Thank you. Okay, you got some questions? Uh, how, do, how well does Pavex work with uh, Rust Analyzer? Do I get all these nice error messages in Visual Studio Code and I turn uh, You don't get them embedded, so you don't get them as tooltips. Uh, technically possible, it's okay. just a med, like, there's a, you can you generate those in a format which then could be embedded into an LSP. The real problem you have is that Rust.json incrementality is, you know, it's there, but it's not amazing. Uh, so it might not be necessarily the most responsive. We do some pretty heavy caching. So as you've seen during the demo, like it doesn't take long to recompile, but it's also not sub millisecond latency. Um, so that's trade-offs at play. If it gets you. faster, we get faster. Questions? What do you think about um, gRPC and how does it compare to, for example, Tonic with uh, gRPC? I mean, uh, I think a lot of things about gRPC, not many that I want to say in a recorded session, um, <laughs> but <laughs> it's something we plan to support. Uh, it's just a different way of specifying what the API looks like. I don't particularly love gRPC, uh, but this is a slightly different approach. Um, Tonic does the approach where you have the spec, you generate the code, and then basically get a bunch of traits or like function signatures that you need to obey. I would probably do it the other way around, uh, where I generate you the types, and then you just create handlers that match the type system, and then I verify that they're right, because I think that's a lot nicer to work with. Um, the, way, the trait approach tends to result in very monolithic handlers and a bunch of stuff I don't particularly like, but it's, it's on the table as many other things. Like gRPC is one of the various specification-driven ways of writing APIs. Um, so it's something we plan to support eventually. Not and yet. Uh, what about client generation, client code generation? That's something I mentioned. Um, the idea being that since we know pretty well what goes in and out of places, uh, we are in a good position to generate specs. There's some caveats to that. Uh, you need to try to make the output types fairly expressive. So you need to kind of set some stuff at compile time. Otherwise, it's difficult to know what headers you set. My approach and my philosophy in general when it comes to specs is that you want to generate the spec from the code as a good first pass. And then you also want to have very easy mechanisms uh, to test spec conformance in tests. And that's likely the approach we're going to take. So try to build something that generates a spec for you, which is going to be reasonably good. Uh, then allow you to modify the spec by hand without us, you know, overriding it every time you actually generate it and give you some facilities in your integration test to actually check that the spec is, you know, conformant at least with all the API, API calls you're making uh, that at least give you some example usage. Okay, thank you. Thanks work. No? Cool. Okay. Luca Palmieri. Thank you.